On the 1st of December, the Prime Minister told this House, in relation to parties during lockdown, all guidance was followed completely in number 10, from that dispatch box. Yeah. On the 8th of December, looks quizzical, he said it. On the 8th of December, the Prime Minister told this House, I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged, there was no party. So since he acknowledges the ministerial code applies to him, will he now resign? No, Mr Speaker. The tawdriest reality show I follow is British politics. I can't even call it a guilty pleasure. Public life in the UK dating at least to the 2016 referendum to leave the European Union is more like a nationwide car wreck in slow motion, making me a rubbernecker at a safe distance. It's intensely polarized. Its political press is equal parts vicious and incestuous. Its left of center party is eternally at war with itself. Its conservative party is improbably successful. All told, the UK sometimes seems like a funhouse mirror reflection of the worst tendencies of my own country's politics. And their government is currently roiled by a political scandal that is, even by their terms, absurd. Prime Minister Boris Johnson stands accused of condoning and at least in some cases attending happy hour. A government inquiry found 16 incidents of inappropriate socialising, mainly at 10 Downing Street in the Cabinet offices between May 2020 and April 2021, when the rest of Great Britain was enduring much stricter anti-COVID measures than those placed on Americans. The Metropolitan Police is now investigating 12 of those parties. Just a few months ago, Observers thought Johnson might stay in office longer than Margaret Thatcher. Now his government could collapse at any moment. For years, Johnson seemed impervious to scandal and incapable of embarrassment. So how has such a seemingly frivolous infraction so damaged such a proudly frivolous man? I'm Alex Perrine. And I'm Laura Marsh. This is The Politics of Everything. Would you like to hear more from TNR? Every day, our writers and editors work to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world. But we can't do it without you. Please consider subscribing to The New Republic with our special offer at tnr.com slash special offer. That's tnr.com slash special offer. We're joined now by an American living in the UK and a Brit living in the US, uh, just to make this conversation as confusing as possible. Libby Watson is a writer in the United States. Nate Bethay is in London. Nate is a writer and producer. Nate, I wanted to get your perspective on this because I've been experiencing this whole Boris Johnson scandal the way I experience all UK news, which is I get up in the morning, I check Twitter, and then there are five utterly incomprehensible tweets from the English people I follow about very crazy sounding scandals involving people with absurd names like Jacob Rees-Mogg. So I get up and I, and I see, oh, I, Jacob Rees-Mogg was caught having cake last March. Now the police are involved. So on the ground in London, what has it been like to experience this scandal through the actual UK press? I think it's been really disorienting because there were so many other things that have taken place since the coronavirus pandemic broke out that you thought would be more damaging to the conservative government. Like Boris Johnson having been caught saying, let the bodies pile high in their thousands, the 12 billion pounds spent on test and trace, which fundamentally didn't really work. All these things you'd be like, this should damage the government and nothing did. But call in the caterpillar cake, that damaged the government. So there are a lot of different parties here. Libby, can you just tell us which party specifically we're talking about? I think the first one was in <laughs> May of 2020, which is very early in the pandemic. Things were really very bad then. It was a wine and cheese party, which is a theme that will crop up over and over again. You know, I do think that's sort of why this has had so much staying power is that the press has been able to talk about the wine and cheese parties that the Tories are having. It's suitably reflective of a bunch of, you know, Tory toffs in Downing Street drinking expensive wine and eating expensive cheese. They're not getting like, you know, a, a party pack from Iceland or whatever. That's one for the Brits out there. That is completely incomprehensible. Iceland not being a country, but a British supermarket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Nate, to give us some context here, mm -hmm. because American listeners with our experience of the pandemic varying quite a bit from state to state, 
But over there, part of the reason this is such a big deal is that lockdown was actually lockdown. Yes. And and something that I'd point out is that the, the big phases of lockdown, you had the initial one starting, I believe, March 2020, and they didn't begin to relax restrictions from that until, I think, late spring, summer 2020. And then subsequently, we had a really big alpha wave in the winter of the end of 2020 into 2021. That was when I think conditions got to their worst. And so we had a lockdown immediately post Christmas. It was like a hard lockdown for a while, and then it slowly eased up. But the restrictions have been pretty stringent, at times enforced very strictly on people. You, there have recently been a, a bunch of stories in the British media about people who were issued fines for things like walking a dog, but two people at once walking a dog. Someone received a thousand pound fine that was later negotiated down to a hundred pounds for basically having an impromptu discussion with people in their garden allotment. I can recall going for a run in Southeast London where I live and on an old canal, the Surrey Canal had been filled in to be like a running trail. There's some parks nearby. And as I was running, the police had a loudspeaker telling people like, go return to your homes, leave the area because they were sunbathing on a warm day. Can you all go home, please? It's not a holiday. It's a lockdown, which means you don't just come in sunbathe. Can you please just leave? I think people's collective anger and frustration at lockdown, given how officially strict it was, how officially intensely enforced it could be at times, and the fact that if you were not someone who could work from home, you were suffering financially. I think that's just created almost like a pressure cooker kind of feeling here. So Libby, you actually spent some time in the UK over the last couple of years. What was your impression of the lockdowns people have been through there and how people experienced them? Because they were pretty different to what even living in somewhere like New York, where we had stay at home orders, they were on a different order to anything that we had in the US. Definitely. I think it's important to note that a lot of these parties happened around Christmas. Like most of the the parties in question were around Christmas and for Christmas 2020. And I think that that was particularly galling because Christmas was kind of cancelled last minute in the UK. I didn't go home for Christmas because of the high case rates. My family had to cancel Christmas last minute. There's that sense that they stole Christmas from us um, because it all happened so last minute. So I think that is a big part of it. But yeah, I mean, I've been back three times since the start of the pandemic. The first time I had to quarantine for two weeks by myself in the countryside. I was in an Airbnb in a, a nearby village. And yeah, technically, I wasn't even supposed to go for walks in the village. This mm. huge open countryside, fields, rolling hills. You Even, even going for like an hour long walk, you would often not even see a person walking their dog. And technically, I was not supposed to be out there at all. I did break those rules. So, you know, come and get me, Boris. <laughs> because, you know, it was ridiculous. You know, even at that point, we absolutely knew that outdoor spread was very, very limited. My stepfather is a doctor. My mom at the time had cancer and had just had a pulmonary embolism. And we decided that it was fine for us to go for walks mm-hmm. outside in the countryside. So, you know, that was a pretty severe lockdown. I went again when my mum passed away. And again, those lockdowns were very strict. We couldn't see her in hospital. We had to take an in turns to see her in the hospice. But yeah, I mean, during the period when these parties were supposed to happen, it was incredibly strict compared to what America talks about lockdown. You can still go to Wendy's. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, that absolutely is like, I think a missing piece of context for Americans as to why people might be so pissed about these parties. It's not just the wine and cheese, you know. Yeah. And people made real sacrifices like the ones that you were describing. I remember even talking to my parents in the UK earlier in 2021, when after I had been fully vaccinated in May, and my husband and I were going away for a weekend and and not living normal lives, but living like pretty well, you know, like it's life had significantly improved. And my mom saying like, um, yeah, like I might be able to go for a walk with one friend mm-hmm. this week, and that's pretty much all I'm allowed to do under mm-hmm. the lockdown rules and. I just hadn't really realized how prolonged the response there had been. And so you can completely understand why people are like, okay, wine time Fridays. I would love to go to wine time Fridays. <laughs> yes. Maybe not with the Tory government. Yes, yes. So that's the other part of this I want to unpack a bit more, which is like the tenor of the parties. Mm. And it's, it is like the details that have come out about these parties, like staff arriving with suitcases full of alcohol that mm. just make it seem like that perfect mix of sort of like Tories high disdain for other people and sort of like almost relish of the tawdriness 
of it, you know, sneaking yeah. in with your suitcase full of alcohol or like inviting the interior decorator from upstairs down to your <laughs> surprise birthday party, walking into a garden full of people, clearly having a party and claiming that you just thought it was work meeting. Remember the fridge? The it wine was like, fridge. Yeah, there was like some newspapers last week. It was like exclusive wine chiller wheeled into Downing Street. <laughs> and they had like a photo of someone wheeling a wine fridge outside and then like it in the office. And it was, but that was like a major revelation. There is this kind of expensive shabbiness about it, isn't there? There is sort of a class element here. These posh Tories, you know, sneaking in suitcases full of wine. It's sort of like, you know, public school boys, uh, you know, or rather private school boys sneaking in sweets from the tuck shop or whatever, you know, <laughs> And it was a, it was an absolutely wonderful time, you know, like the, these these kind of like posh assholes, basically, like flouting the rules and having fun with it, and it being a, a jolly good time. And the rest of us, you know, just like, what are you, what are you doing? This is pathetic. But yeah, it's exactly that kind of like enjoyment of flouting the rules at the same time as the hypocrisy. Well, the thing it reminded me of, too, was the British upper class's obsession with secret parties and joining clubs for the purpose of having secret parties. And Boris Johnson was a member of the Bullingdon Club at Oxford, mm -hmm. as David Cameron was. Mm -hmm. This highly exclusive society, impossible to get into, does everything in secret and just like has these rampaging kind of joyless parties where they just smash windows and get really drunk. But the mm -hmm. point is that it's secret. That's the whole point. It's secret and it's exclusive. It's super exclusive mm -hmm. and it's hidden from the public and it's the place where the ruling classes go and say, like, it doesn't matter how we act. We're not bound by any code. We don't have to be kind of present ourselves as decent because this is our club. And I think you see some of the same traits in these parties that were happening in the garden and in the cabinet office and, and basically everywhere where they did what they want and they all had this kind of cover story for it, which was that they would just say with a smirk, well, it was a work meeting. And I think that that's why there was such rage at Allegra Stratton at the beginning of all this, when the clip came out of her actually rehearsing how she would defend these parties, if asked, where she says with this huge grin on her face and like just this posture of like, yes, I know I'm lying and there's nothing mm -hmm. you can do about it oh, well, it was just some wine and cheese at a work meeting. Allegra Stratton is Boris Johnson's former press secretary who resigned in December as a result of this scandal. I've Ed. just seen reports on Twitter that there was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognize those reports? <laughs> I went home. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, uh, uh, Would the Prime Minister condone uh, having a Christmas <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't want the party. It was cheese and wine. Just be clear, it's not on this. <laughs> is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business meeting. <laughs> I'm joking. This is recorded. This fictional party was a business meeting. And it was not socially distanced. My impression is like Boris could get away with having this persona of being a person to whom rules don't apply mm -hmm. when he was, to use the American vernacular, owning the libs. But it's different when it comes to this sort of shared sacrifice thing, when it wasn't about like owning the libs, but about like owning the people who are all trying to collectively get through this crisis. <laughs> it was different. Well, so this is the question, right? People were somewhat aware, at least, of these parties. Journalists were somewhat aware of these parties when they happened, didn't report on them. Yes. Why now? What's changed? What has Boris Johnson done that has created an opening for the press to attack him this way? I mean, something that comes to mind is that I know there was a lot of pressure on him from the rest of his party to cut the isolation times from 10 to 5 days. He didn't do that. There's been more pressure to reopen more fully and get rid of COVID restrictions. Is, is this an element in the timing of the attacks on him? I would say yes. I would also say there are some people in the Tory party who are uncomfortable with the amount of fiscal stimulus under what did exist under Johnson and would prefer someone like Sunak, who is a hardcore austerity politician. I think there's an extent to which Johnson may have just sort of he's been around long enough to have you know served his use. I think that's all true. And I, I also think, that, you know, Tories just love doing this. They absolutely love stabbing each other in the back and yes. climbing it over each other's bodies to get to the top. Yes. And I'm sure there are people who have just been waiting for their moment to strike with Boris. I think there's probably just a kind of dam breaking effect where, you know, s senior Tories who want to get rid of him for one reason or another 
you know, are sort of waiting until it seems like enough of the other Tories are kind of on board. It can't just be one or two. They have to feel like there's going to be enough people, enough MPs, so that they don't look silly if they try. We've talked about how the public, why the public would legitimately be outraged about this. But to talk about the role the media plays, I I think is really important. I want to sort of get a sense of how coordinated you feel like this media blitz has been. And I think it's important to highlight, too, how more insular and less diverse the UK media is than the US media. And we complain about the US media quite a bit here. But you said, like, how coordinated is this? It, there's sort of an extent to which whenever anything becomes a big story in the UK media, you have the sense that it is sort of coordinated or is at least springing from a WhatsApp group chat or something. Yes. Obviously, there are different media outlets. You know, there is a difference between The Sun and The Times or The Times and The Guardian or whatever. But there is much more kind of uh not even necessarily group think, but probably just sort of group hanging out. You know, it's not like it's even, it's not like in DC, there isn't a trouble with Beltway journalists all hanging out with each other. But, you know, there are at least two cities in the US where <laughs> yeah. most journalists live. In the UK, it's it's probably, even you know, two it's neighbors. It's like a neighborhood, right? It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, they're very, very insular and all located in the same geographic area and probably all mostly come from the same schools and universities. It's a, yeah, it's a real recipe for trouble. I would also point out, I just remember reading about this, if you're familiar with the former Guardian journalist Gary Young, wrote about some of the issues with, call that insularity and the sort of like perfect class solidarity among British journalists. And one of the points he made is that about 7% of people in the United Kingdom are privately educated. So about 93% are go to state schools. Whereas journalists working in the UK today, it's about 51% of them are privately educated. Mm -hmm. However, when you start getting into columnist positions and editorial positions, Gary Young actually did the legwork to determine this. And he he basically said, I can say with confidence that more people are privately educated as columnists or editors in British media than members of the House of Lords. So that (laughs) gives you an impression of how what this I mean, the House of Lords has hereditary peerages still like you can inherit (laughs) your title of Lord from your father, who was a Lord who got his lordship in the 15th century or whatever, you know, and it feels as though when these things take place. They wouldn't take place if... It, no, I'm not going to say that like, someone gives the order on high. But more like people wouldn't feel comfortable coming forward with this stuff unless they knew that it wasn't going to just wind up in them being punished and ostracized. Mm-hmm. You know, I've made the joke that your goal as a British journalist isn't to break stories and report the news or hold, you know, power to account. It's to make sure you get invited to the spectator's garden party every year. And as long as you do that, you've achieved your goal. And it's like, I just... I don't want to be cynical, but there is an extent to which you have to understand the media culture of this country and how unhealthy it is. Something that I think we should point out for American listeners is that being a journalist is a great stepping stone to becoming a politician in the UK, Mm. which is almost unthinkable in America. But Boris Johnson, former journalist, George Osborne, former chancellor, also former journalist and now again a journalist and editor of a newspaper. So you have this very insular media class that's also a heavily overlapping... Intermingled with the political class. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And also, one thing I would just leave you on, too, is that wage growth in the UK is quite poor. In fact, right now, adjusted for inflation, people are earning less than they earned on average. A starting journalist salary in the UK is going to be in the low £20,000 a year range. And so you find a situation where people, to be journalists, like... You kind of have to come from a background, not necessarily be completely wealthy, but enough that like, if you are between jobs or if you have an expensive month, you're not going to be bankrupt. You're not going to get evicted. And you see this huge disconnect between people who things are going relatively well for them and they report the news versus, you know, a lot of people under the age of 40 in this country, like they've seen negative wage growth. A lot of them who are not from London or from the Southeast are from communities that have closed their public libraries, closed their youth centers. And it's just life is basically getting worse. And then you have this disconnect between how it's portrayed and the people doing the coverage of it versus how life is experienced here. And I think that adds to that discontent that we've talked about. You don't have to buy health insurance, though. So that's that is true. (laughs) On that note, thank you to both of you for the sparkling conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's just like being at the Spectator Garden Party. (laughs) That's exactly what I was going to (laughs) say. Nate Bethay is a co-host of Trash Future Podcast. Libby Watson writes the newsletter Sick Note on Substack. After the break, we'll be back to talk about who Boris is and what made him so appealing to the British electorate. 
I'd love to tell you about the podcast Intelligent Squared US. Since 2006, Intelligent Squared US has addressed a fundamental problem in America, the extreme polarization of our nation and our politics. You can hear today's top thinkers debate the most important issues of the day in an unbiased civil forum grounded in civility and respect, tackling topics that range from technology to law to international relations with China. Intelligent Squared US is a smart and engaging podcast that helps challenge your perspective and calls for a return to balance civil discourse in the public square. Download it now and think twice about where you stand. We're talking now with Edward Docks, a novelist and screenwriter who last year wrote for The Guardian about Boris's persona and appeal. So, Ed, we've been talking about Wine Time Fridays and the Boris birthday party and the accumulation of scandals about Boris breaking the lockdown rules. And we've tried to understand why people are so angry specifically about this rather than about all the other stuff he's done. And it feels like a big part of understanding that is just understanding who Boris Johnson is, how he appeals to the British electorate more broadly. And that's something that obviously you've written about and thought about a lot. There's an image in your piece that really struck me as encapsulating kind of a unique quality of Boris, where you describe him on the zip line. Can you just tell us what that was, what it looked like, (laughs) and what you think it says about Boris? So the images of Boris, he's on a zip wire. He's got a silly Union Jack hat on. And he's halfway between, well, the two ends of the zip wire. And what happened in real life is the zip wire got stuck. (laughs) So he was dangling above the poor London people in a kind of ill-fitting suit, which was scrunched up around his groin with his sort of silly hair popping out, all kind of trussed up like a child in a sort of baby walker holding these two awful plastic Union Jack flags and kind of waving them. And of course, if you think about politics in a meta sense, that's an image of being stranded, an image of having messed up, of things going wrong, of Mm. buffoonery, essentially, for someone like David Cameron, certainly for Theresa May, you could never imagine her doing that. But even going back, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, John Major, Mrs Thatcher, no other prime minister could have got stuck and looked so foolish and yet at the same time not only kind of brushed that off but even turned it to their advantage made them look carefree and appealing and part of Johnson's I think now vanished but previous appeal to the British electorate was the appeal of a clown he is or or was seen as somebody who transcended class stratifications, crossed party boundaries left and right. And he did that by virtue of being a clown-like figure, by being somebody who inverted norms, made uh, fun of things, appealed to the British public sense of humour. It's why he won the leadership election, and it's why he managed to get Brexit done. So tell us, if Boris is a clown, what role do clowns serve in society? Like, what function do they fulfil? Well, what clowns do is they remind us of our mortality. If you're thinking in dramatic types, they're the inverse of the priest. So the priest reminds us of uh, the soul, prayer, and those kind of things. The clown reminds us of appetites of eating, drinking, banging your head, falling over, laughing. And in Johnson's case, I think sex as well with all the affairs and the children. Johnson, you know, appeals to that. His appearance basically says, look, you can't take clothes seriously. I don't take clothes. Are you seriously wearing a suit? Don't be ridiculous. Suits are silly. And then he says, oh, God, I've got to have some more cake. You've got to have some cake. We all want cake. Dieting. How ridiculous could that? Grooming, dieting, ludicrous. Eat cake, wear silly clothes. Look at my hair. Why are you styling your hair? You know it's vain. You know it's a waste of time. And of course, we do know that because we we go along to a certain extent with what Johnson's kind of saying, which is the world is absurd. It's an absurdist thing to do, to put yourself in a suit and do your hair and try and lose weight. And that side of life, he reminds voters of the stupidity of the circus of politics. And they thank him for that. 
the idea of politics as, as a circus is very common, but for especially for American listeners, I want to give them a sense of the general tone of British politics and of other politicians, how Boris is doing things that they wouldn't get away with. Yes, I think it's not so much that the UK... I mean, if you watch our, our PMQ's parliamentary questions, it's much closer to a circus than any other country. It's just people shouting at each other, jumping up and down. I mean, it's almost chaos. It's not so much that the whole political domain is serious. It's more that the history of attempting to become prime minister is the moment when you declare your seriousness. and You say to the nation, look, I'm going to lead this party and I'm going to do it seriously. Johnson has no interest in, in the sincerity of politics. And he's like nobody we've ever seen before. I think when he goes, all of the very interesting characteristics that have got him into power will also be counted as reasons why he couldn't wield power. What I find, and I think that you've kind of helped crystallize this for me, right? There's something liberatory about Johnson saying, the rules of the elite don't apply to me. And then people say, yes, that's right. Like, you don't have to follow the rules. We love that. But then when he is the elite imposing the rules, that is when he has crossed a bridge too far. So it's other people's rules. I want to violate those. But when he violates the rules he set for everyone else, that's when he crosses the line. That's right. It's hypocrisy that sticks in the craw of the electorate. And as I'm sure is the same in the US, we have countless daily news stories of tragedy. And not least, the very, very stark image, the one thing you can't do in the UK, the very stark image of the Queen mourning the death of Prince Philip on her own, wearing a, a mask. And that violation, that hypocrisy, it's probably the only thing a British prime minister can never do is mock the Queen. Mm. And it, it feels like he mocked the Queen. Johnson crossed the line. Case two, it's like you have two leaders, right? You have the symbolic leader who's following all the rules, which she didn't make. And then you have Boris Johnson who made the rules and didn't. And it's, it's a very easy comparison to make between those two things. That's right. And I think however much the public tolerate, indulge Johnson, they love the Queen more. So to take the Queen on, make the Queen wear a mask to mourn her husband whilst you're partying, that's a line I don't think even Johnson can cross, which is why I think he's toast. So the thing that's meant to happen when revelations like this come out is that you're supposed to resign in disgrace. Mm -hmm. And there have been so many points at which Johnson, <laughs> if he were any other politician, I think would have stepped back. He's sort of broken that norm by saying, well, let's see what the inquiry says. We've been working really hard, ambushed by cake, and so on. Can you bring us up to speed on what he has been trying to do to get attention away from this whole scandal? Well, the short version is everything and anything. He's got a very simple and obvious strategy, which is just delay everything as much as possible. And the reason that strategy works is we have, in fact, got party fatigue a bit because there's so many parties. So as it goes on, it gets less, perhaps, in the mind of the public. The second thing is to hide behind Sue Gray and then hide behind the, the police report. And then the third thing is this kind of policy of red meat, which is kind of hard right wing policies that he announces. But he does it on the hoof. I mean, they're not real policies. So he just announced that we might move some illegal immigrants to Ghana, and then Ghana immediately denied that that had happened. And so he just makes stuff up. He's trying to use, sadly, trying to use the Ukraine as well. So if he doesn't resign, and it looks like he's not considering that, what happens? Are there any consequences for him? So one of the arcane and weird things about British politics is that with a sitting Tory leader, it's different if it's Labour, but with a sitting Tory leader... In order to have a vote of no confidence in that leader, you have to have 15% of the MPs write a letter to a thing called the 1922 Committee, which is this arcane committee that, in my imagination anyway, lives in a wood panel room and they all smoke cigars. Mm -hmm. So only when 15% of the MPs have written a letter of no confidence is a no confidence vote triggered. And at the moment, um, that 15% is 54, 54 MPs. So the position we're in at the moment is some Tory MPs have sent in a letter. And we assume when, if the police, Sue Gray, all the rest of it, proves that Johnson lied to Parliament, then many, many more letters will go in. 
And at that point, there will be a, a vote of no confidence. But he could survive the vote of no confidence. And mm -hmm. even more weirdly, if he survives the vote of no confidence, there can't be another vote of no confidence in him for a year. So it is conceivable that we have the maddest situation possible, an absolutely crazed clown buffoon of a prime minister who his own party have had no confidence in, who the parliament has no confidence in, but who continues to be PM and no one can move him. We can't get rid of him. Right. Regardless of maybe Boris leaves, maybe he stays. What do you think the lasting damage of this whole episode has been? I mean, I'm, I, I campaigned for Remain and I'm on the Remain side of the UK. So from my personal perspective, I think Johnson's done untold damage. He was never a lever. He was a Remain facing conservative liberal. He made documentaries about Turkey. He's a classicist. He loves Europe. And I'm of the view that he wanted to fight to leave only in order to position himself well for the leadership. Mm. And the optimum outcome for Johnson was to lose that referendum narrowly, then to fight for the leadership of the Conservative Party and say, look, it has to be Remain. Sorry, I was a lever, but Remain won. So then he wins big because then all the Remain voters vote for him and the Leave voters vote for him. So I think his damage and his legacy is huge because I think he's taken us out of Europe unseriously, not from a point of view of even political seriousness. I think that he's got into power without a plan. He doesn't really know what he's doing. Everything's tricks and diversions. And he's also an inveterate and, and perhaps even compulsive liar. So he's unable to run the system very well. And uh, I've got to be honest with you, I think all areas of policy have really, really suffered as a result of that. And because we're living in this kind of weird Brexit, double, double think world, a kind of Orwellian world, we as a country can't face our problems honestly. So right now there's massive queues at the port of Dover with all the goods stuck with doing all the customs declarations. And the government just deny it. We can't have a sensible conversation about that. And there's all of these kind of weird Johnsonian contradictions. I mean, Jonathan Swift, the great satirical writer, couldn't really nail Johnson down. It, it's so bizarre, the world that we're living in. An example many of the journalists were writing, it's a huge relief to Johnson that he's being investigated by the police because it delays everything. <laughs> and he can now say it's a police. I mean, what prime minister would wake up on a weekday morning and think, yeah, great, the police are involved. I'd bought myself some time. It's insane. Well, this kind of brings us back to the last episode we did about British politics, which began with Boris announcing that he had COVID. Yeah. And this again was sort of like, oh, thank goodness I have COVID because now I can say I've had it and I don't have to do anything else about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean... In many ways, he is a great Briton. He's just a disaster as a leader. It's just a kind of crazed, manic incompetence, a wild, risk-taking, fabulating, moment-to-moment, -moment, seat of your pants, bullshitting kind of approach to politics. I mean, even Trump had a cogent worldview. I'm not saying it's a nice worldview. I'm not saying it's a good worldview. But you couldn't tell me what Johnson wants to do. Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell me what his policies were. You couldn't tell me what the man thought about X, Y, and Z. He doesn't know what he thinks. He just thinks, can I get away with tomorrow? <laughs> it's crazy. It's really crazy. Thank you so much for talking to us. A great pleasure. Thank you for having me. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Melissa Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoyed the politics of everything and you want to support the show, one thing you can do is go to wherever you listen to the podcast and rate the show. Every rating and review helps. Thanks for listening.